Good afternoon, everybody. We can happily allow ourselves to be dazzled by Andreas Weber, as so many of us were by his 2019 Bashara lecture at the Royal Asiatic Society, titled Ecosystems as Love Processes, and before that by his 2017 interview in the Bashara magazine, titled A Biology of Wonder. His biology indeed takes a new approach, and he is also a philosopher, with what has been called a dazzling blend of biological rigor and poetic grace, and influenced, for example, by the living mountain of Nan Shepherd, whose intense poetic prose explores and records the rocks, the rivers, creatures, and hidden aspects of the remarkable landscape of the Cairngorms, whose essential nature Shepherd spent a lifetime in search of. Perhaps as we aspire to new life after these long periods of lockdown, Andres's work offers us a dose of the best medicine for a culture benumbed by dead-end pursuits, as Joanna Macy says. Pulsing with life, his work delivers us from the centuries-long dichotomies between mind and matter, that have robbed us of vitality, joy, and true purpose. It brings us home to the fertile reciprocities that link us with all forms and levels of life. In so doing, it reflects and reinforces great spiritual teachings of our planet. And Andreas is busily exploring new ways through the climate emergency, which I'm sure he will mention today in this series under the general title of Unity in Diversity. Andreas is that new kind of scientist who believes that love is the prime motive for all creation. A biologist who rejects the neo-Darwinian view that survival and reproduction are the only evolutionary imperatives. A scientist for whom reciprocity, beauty and love is a necessity in ecosystems in the entire world of nature. A human being who again and again points to our most intimate natural connections with beauty. Writing in a recent essay for the Center for Humans and Nature titled Skin-Centric Ecology, when we experience beauty, something in us knows this. Our sensible skin knows. Our breathing chest knows. Our eyes taking in light and radiating light outwards with every gaze know. We know that we are part and parcel of this grand exchange. We know that we are family. And then, bless him, he movingly writes, beauty is family. To realize ourselves as alive means to realize ourselves as family totally englobed and absolutely unique, free to act yet bound by dreadful family ties that require reciprocity, if only to continue breathing in towards myself and out towards the other. And those of you who were lucky enough to participate in Kajasti Mystery's Zoroastrian meditation will recognize this. Beauty, he writes, entails its own ethics. Although the experience of joy and emotional assent associated with beauty elevates the self, <clears throat> at the same time it points in the opposite direction. Assent comes through connection, and connection warrants a certain attitude. We can only exist if we don't put our ego in the center because the skin is always shared. Where mine opens up, yours starts. Where my epidermis blossoms, it meets the breath of the world, which is the faint presence of every being's skin. Feeling the lichen skin against mine means realizing that I am myself an act of relating, not a separate individual distinct from other objects. Feeling this skin requests that I do my part to make relating possible. Todd Lawson reminded us of the transformative power of beauty 
in his paper on Joseph and the myth of reconciliation. And now it is my great pleasure to do my part on behalf of those of you assembled here today within the noble family of his Bisharan and to express your great welcome, our great welcome to Andreas Weber as our speaker this afternoon when he's going to talk with us about the joy of embodiment. Welcome, Andreas. Uh, thanks so much. Um, and it, uh, your, your introduction reminds me to, uh, of the, uh, the beautiful afternoon we spent, uh, many, many of us spent together at the Asian Society um, 2019. Um, and um, I try to somehow live up to your introduction, actually. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that I did not um, prepare um, anything closely, uh, even, even distantly related to the text you just quoted, because then you would have ru ruined my, my talk. <laughs> although, I, although I admit that I loved, um, I loved uh, the, um, so I, 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 I love the quote because it's, it's um, spot on what I'm going to try to, to explain. Okay. So um, what I'm doing in my work um, is um, more and more actually in, in these uh, last years, in, in the current time, um, is, is an attempt to understand um, not only ourselves, humans, as, um, as embodied subjects, so as um, selves, feeling selves, um, which can be feeling selves only because they have bodies, and not only the animated world as feeling selves, as I, uh, as I had, have been working on for um, over two decades probably, but I am expanding this into trying to understand the whole of reality as a feeling body. And um, this is what I will try to uh, take you with me, um, the, the journey I want to, to invite you on um, today. Um, so um, it's, it's a, as, as thinking, it always goes in steps, so you, you, at least my, my thinking, probably everybody's thinking, is, is a sort of um, exploration um, which, when arrived at a certain point, then um, looking over the, the land topography um, shows different paths, new directions to go. And um, at this moment, it, to me, it's, it feels really important that we understand that um, there is no uh, dualistic gap anywhere in, the, in reality between um, fundamentally different entities. Um, so there is no gap between mind and matter, and there's no gap between life and anorganic processes. And um, so that's, it's, 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 it's also the attempt to um, to overcome dualism, which has been the um, defining stance of Western philosophy for probably the last 2000 years, which always made these distinctions. And it always made these distinctions in a way that humans were on the side where, no, I, I shouldn't say humans, um, rational thinking male humans where on the, on the side where you could decide what did not belong to the side who could control over life and death of, of the remainder of this world. And um, we can see right now in, this, in these times, sadly, um, that this, um, this view has come to an end. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't really come to a, let's say, epistemic end, it's, not, it's still very much influencing the mainstream view um, of, um, many, um, of many people, of institutions, 
of political decisions of um, of the economy for sure but it comes it comes to an end um, in a performative way which which is um, the ecological disaster we're living in and which surely um, includes the COVID-19 pandemics as it is an ecological disaster. So what I'm, what I'm trying to propose um, is that um, it's not only um, about living better and more joyfully in our own bodies in the shared world um, to, um, to try to um, get closer to such a view. It's also an imperative of um, continuing um, to live in togetherness on this planet. And um, so I think it is really timely to, um, to go beyond dualism. I promised a, a short lecture, but I'm still on the, on the, on the introductory slide. So let's, let's hop into the, the talk. So that's, these are the um, small chapters I'm trying to lead you through. Um, I will start with a little story. I probably will tell you more little experiential stories, um, which always in my life relate my experiencing um, to my thinking, um, matter from the inside. Um, and then I will try to um, set the topic of the whole, the whole of the cosmos, which differentiates us into feeling individuals. I will um, argue for the idea that we could understand the whole of what happens as poetic space. And poetic space comes about by not only by one individual's experience alone. It's always reciprocity and more than reciprocity, it's mutual transformation. And um, in being a body, which we certainly are, in a world of bodies, we are able to communicate with this embodied world because bodies mirror bodies, bodies understand bodies. I'll talk about um, this process of communication as the exchange of breath. And um, David has already alluded um, to some um, of my thoughts concerning this. I'll, I'll go through this again. And, um, and then I will be um, concluding um, in, a, in an idea of um, this world as realized togetherness. I'll, I'll, I'll also show you some of my best uh, pictures about um, places where I, um, um, where, 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 let's say where certain insights of this um, somehow um, um, crystallized in a, in a more graspable form. And I show you this uh, picture of um, the, the Mediterranean um, after um, a gale. Um, at the coast close to Genoa, where I was, um, um, I was lucky to spend some weeks there as a um, artist, art, uh, as an artist in residence, and um, I show you this because um, I, I, I wrote a book there, but I had uh, a lot of time to feel with the with the sea, and. Um, and I had a lot of time to reflect about why it is so, it seems so um, the, the sea seems to be so necessary in teaching us things we don't really understand. And uh, there were, there was one crucial moment in, w during this storm where another resident um, stood at the railing um, in the garden of this place overlooking the sea. And I met her there standing there and she was, she was actually cheering the waves which crashed on the rocks 
below. It was a bit closer than here. This is a sort of distant distance, long distance um, photo. It, it was closer, so you could smell the spray and you, you got wet in the face. And she was cheering on these waves. And, um, and we stood there and we realized, talking about it, that we were just filled by elation just by standing there and witnessing these waves doing their, their, their play, their, um, their dance, their, um, their ecstasy in meeting rock. And this gave me, this, this really made me think. Um, I mean, it's, it wasn't the first time, but, but somehow I, I got a little bit far, farther maybe uh, this time, because I suddenly realized that um, I am so I, I am I am so happy about matter in ecstasy. Because I am matter in ecstasy, it's just what I am. So I had this this revelation at this place um, at the Mediterranean Sea that um, it is actually very easy to understand why the waves in their, um, in their, in their, in, in the moment of their essence of being waves um, breaking and spraying make me, make me joyful because what I see is, is matter in its essence um, getting in touch with other matter. And that is something which I know from myself because I'm also matter which meets other matter. And because I know how it is to be, um, to be, to feel myself in full movement. There's a, um, there's a beautiful um, um, line in um, one of Coetzee's books, which I, I also somewhere quoted in my works, where he says, um, if you see another living being, a bird in the sky, um, being in full possession of his bodily powers and just full of life, he says, full of life, um, then you know that he is also full of joy because you know that being full of life is full of joy. So this is still um, pointed to a, another living being. But I think it's easy to enlarge this because we, as we, in the same way, we um, can admit that we humans are animals. We can also admit that we humans are matter. And um, we can have all our experiences only because we are matter. And this was, this was actually, um, a, it was a, re a relief to, to feel this and to, to understand this, or to at least to, to have the, um, the impression to understand this. Because then, then suddenly I was not separated from the sea, which did this um, ecstatic movement, which made me joyful, but I couldn't understand it like before. It was, it, was, it was always beautiful, but I always was asking myself, but why? And um, just accepting myself as being matter, it wasn't difficult anymore. So I was um, um, using, if I use the words of David's introduction, I was suddenly family with the water. And then, as you all know, that's, um, that is not just a metaphor. And um, it's, it's actually, it's actually um, material reality that we are water and we are a way of water to gain um, a, a particular form and a particular um, self-experience. I, um, that's, that's by the way, as you can imagine, that's another shot from this um, um, crucial place where I, where I had the occasion to think so much about, about water and from the perspective of water and hence from the perspective of matter. Um, and, um, 
what I, what I what I put there, I read it to you, the little quote, and then I'm going to explain is, um, so we are actually matter and we are liquid matter to a big part. Um, so our body, and I'll explain later, but it's, it's important um, to, 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 to tell you this. Our body is the fashion in which the ocean thinks its own unfolding into a tiny space. The ocean is the manner in which my body experiences its own inside. When I connect to the ocean, I can make contact to this inside. And um, just, just reading this now to you, it's, it comes to my mind um, that I, um, this, this, it's, this, is, this is actually an older idea and I should, I should have put a, I mean, it's, it's something I elaborated there again, but it, it stems, um, it comes from, a, from some, a time a little bit before this. Um, again, I, was, um, I wasn't only at the ocean, but I was even in the ocean, again in Italy at the island of Elba. And um, again, I had this feeling of something fundamentally right. And then I, um, I, I was thinking, okay, so it's actually, it's actually a, a moment in which um, same meets same, water meets water. But this same, which meets same, is still, is, is different. So it has, in a way, become individualized. And from this standpoint of, of individuation, of folding back onto itself or folding back onto myself, um, it can make an experience of the bigger picture, of the bigger surroundings, of that from which it comes or from which I come. And this experience in this reflective way of, of looking back um, elucidates the, um, the horizon or the, the, the matrix where this individual stems from. And um, so, so we have a possibility because we are not disembodied minds, um, but we are minds only because mind is, as biologists sometimes say, wetware, because mind is working as chemical balances in water in organized compartments, which are called neurons and flesh and muscles and um, skin, whatever, all these tissues. Um, we, only because mind is embodied, um, it can be there. Um, so um, if you turn it around, um, this body has always this side to it in which it necessarily um, must refer to itself and must make an experience of itself. And this experience is um, first primordially an experience of matter. And not of matter outside, but of matter which is myself. There is a, um, a physicist and um, feminist thinker which has become very famous, um, Californian, um, Californian physicist, Karen Barad. Some of you might know her. Um, and she has um, almost one-handedly started a turn in philosophy, uh, which now is called the material turn. Um, in, in very nicely um, emphasizing that in philosophy, until she was pushing for this turn in the, the early 2000s, um, we were talking of so many m meanings which mattered, but we didn't ever talk about how matter mattered. And in a way, what I'm doing here is um, um, following her her lead, only that I'm doing this not from a um, standpoint of a, a critical feminist physicist, but uh, from the standpoint of a um, poetic biologist, let's say, a nature writer and biologist. Um, so what, just to retain from this is that if our inner experience is bound to bodies which meet other bodies, then this experience is 
never abstract in the sense that it can be detached from the from this body and from the meeting of other bodies and it is as our body is made made from the bodies of this world it is always an experience of the whole of the totality of this world but it is an experience which which does not show the totality um, as a as an objective representation uh, about which you could talk um, in a um, in a classical scientific way in a representational way you know put, put, write it down on a blackboard or make a diagram or count and measure it it's it's a way of knowing which 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 is always engagement and which also always means risking yourself to 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 allow the ocean to understand itself um, as enclosed in a tiny space you need to swim in it and then you could also drown in it or at least you get wet or you get cold and um, so it's not never abstract it's always um, it's always a communion it's always something which you need to do together and which will forever change you <clears throat> and that's probably the only way to understand reality. So the, the Western idea of um, making, um, of doing all, I mean, I mean some, some, in some, to some um, extent, it's absolutely possible, but to do all, to get, understand all by doing objective measurements is probably, is surely wrong. Okay, poetic space. So you, you probably always uh, already grog what I'm going to um, explain um, as my understanding of poetic space. Um, poetic space then as the experience of inwardness, of, of meaning, uh, of self is always tied to the embodiment of this meaning in matter then is neither only inner experience nor only matter so you, it's, it's not separable it's never you can never sort it to one side or the other it is embodied felt meaning it is constant transformation and through this existential meaning so this is this is more or less what i what i've said before in a more condensed way and um let me put it again in, in slightly differently so it becomes more clear. Um, if, we, if we are able to experience and to um, crystallize these experiences into categories and concepts and signs and abstract ideas, um, only because um, we are, this is a function of our embodiment, our embodiment of our, 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 our being bodies made of matter, um, then it, it is not possible to separate one from the other. So you always get both. You always get um, something like meaningful experience if you take matter, or you always get matter you always need matter if you are going to have meaningful experience. So space is not only geometrical, it's, all, it's also poetic. So it's filled with meaningfulness and experience, which makes it totally different. As you know, the, the idea of space in, in the Occidental paradigm is that it is a a neutral arrangement of things. Um, among those, among which some happen to be your body, which also can be in a neutral way rearranged by, for example, um, having surgery or um, a tooth repair at the dentist. So, so far the theory. And then comes the, the big problem that inside this um, neutral topography of things sits your experience and is also this experience is also able to somehow guide or maneuver this 
topography of things, which is your body. And um, nobody can really explain this. So that's, that's, that's a, little, a little bit maybe um, um, on the caricature side, still the, the Occidental worldview with the ensuing um, mind matter problem. Or as a uh, neuro neuroscientist, neurophilosopher David Chalmers called it, um, the, the hard problem of consciousness. It's, it's how can this interiority somehow fit into something which um, has not any of this. And it's, it's puzzling it's puzzling Western philosophy um, since Plato, I'd say. And um, I, my, my daughter, um, I told some before when we were gathering in the, and waiting for the start, my daughter is about to, to make the final exams for her high school, um, so high school exam. And she has, um, she's focusing, she's concentrating on philosophy. That's one of her, her fo focus um, matters. So she rehearsed this um, much together with me as her family expert for philosophy. And it's, again, it became so clear to me that, that in, this, in this long row of thinkers, from the, the, the English empiricists um, over um, Berkeley and Kant and um, then the uh, logical positivism and so on, it's, it's Western philosophy is working on the, on, on the tragic enigma of how can experience be part of this world if this world is only things. And, um, and I think our, our personal um, testimony is that it's actually not only things. So because we are the thing that is clearly thing, but on the other hand, clearly experienced. So in, in a way we have a very privileged standpoint, um, but we don't really insist on it. And we very much give in to the, to the, the myth that um, a part of us is only thing. And the other part is somewhere desperately not at home in this thing. Okay, so that was a, that was a little loop just to, to underline the to my eyes, the necessity of, of working into this direction. So what I propose instead is to see everything as always a communion of being a concrete filling time and space as flesh, as dust, as sand, as rock, as water. And at the same time, being of and of at least potentially an inward standpoint, a meaningful standpoint. And, um, so, and, and thus really having a, a new look onto the world. And I would say that um, if we uh, take this plunge and hop over the, the occidental rift, which, um, separates the world in, in two, in, in those who create meaning and all the rest who is forbidden to have any meaning. Then suddenly, so many um, experiences become truly meaningful again, which, which seemed absurd before. And um, this is also why I'm showing you these um, relatively freshly shot spring pictures from my neighborhood, these um, 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 sprouts and little um, blossoms opening. Um, because in being part of poetic space and in being matter in a process of um, of aliveness, of um, unfolding of desiring existence, um, we can understand other individuations of matter as being part of this process. It's, it's very difficult to do this if we insist on being only rational or on being rational slash um, empirical. If we, if we look at, these, um, at this plant from a 
only rational standpoint, it will slip away more and more. If we look at it, it, it from an only empiricist standpoint, we probably arrive again at the idea that um, living beings are machines, like um, modern biology has held for, for a long, long time. And, um, but if we understand that um, um, the, the, the experience of being within a body, um, which, which from itself generates um, meaning and um, a necessity to connect and an understanding of um, what it means to be a body, suddenly the world becomes a place where you can understand one another, although you don't speak their languages. And I think that's a very, um, it's, it's absolutely necessary. Um, and it's feeling really good. Like I told you when I finally um, understood, for me, I, I, I must really say understood that, that I'm actually not different at all from the wave crashing on the rock and I'm and for this reason, it makes me happy. I was vastly relieved. And um, so if we allowed ourselves to, um, to, to welcome other beings into this poetic space, we, we could only stop. We could not do other than stop um, so many violence, which we commit um, in regard of these others, which so far have not officially been admitted into this space. They are still other, they are still um, just things. They are still um, something which can be only used. This tree which, which makes these twigs with these um, blossoms is, for example, is standing, it's very pi picturesque and very beautiful. And it's, it's actually the last tree, the, uh, the, the, the hired, cheap gardener troop has left standing so far. So it's in grave danger to, to be chopped away the next time they pass. Um, and um, because it's not visible, if you don't, if you, if you see at things only from the standpoint of uh, does this object fit into, um, into the rest of the furniture, then, then um, some, some things are not visible. And some things in yourself are not visible. Okay, so if we, if we share this poetic space, um, what, what does that mean for, um, um, for our individuality, for the way our individuality comes about? Um, and this is something I, now I'm taking you away from the, the, from the, from the ocean with this little detour to the, um, the growing tree in, in my, in the garden of the, the condominium I'm living in Berlin. And I'm, I'm taking you to the river, which is flowing um, uh, through the valley where I'm living in Italy, when, when I'm in Italy, um, which also has taught me a lot of wisdom, actually. It's actually, like, hearing me say this, um, it's, I'm, a, I'm actually really grateful to to have been uh, um, able to letting myself ask by these huge beings for what I can respond to them. And uh, this river has asked me uh, a lot about um, how in this world, um, everything which encounters something else takes some part of the shape of this other something and gives away a little bit of itself so that both mutually transform um, through one another. And you see the, um, these, um, these rocks in a way are the produce of the water and the water can only run the way it runs because of the rocks. So all, also there, um, you have a profound, um, meaningful relationship, um, which shapes whole landscapes and which is not just um, a neutral arrangement of things. This river that was a, 
was it now it's a different aspect and um at some places forms these pools and in summer you can if you know where they are you can um find your way there um bushwhacking and then find a um sunny beach and a nice cool still um area of the river and um what I want to talk about is the idea that in this world, there is something like an ever active tendency in things to congregate and to bond together into new, more complex, more sophisticated forms. For this reason, we could even describe physics as a science of relationships. So in this poetic space, um, there's constant movement and there's constant um, becoming of individuals and there's also constant dissolution of individuals which we call death and which we very much fear um, as humans and as all animate beings as all animals and plants perhaps but it's at the same time it is the necessary process of creating new individuals and thus creating new relationships, creating new togetherness. And the, the most profound idea, teaching of, of, of water concerning relationships, again, the, the, the river, is that, that both parts um, in this meeting transform one another. Touched by water, the stone become, becomes soft and liquid broken by stone, the water becomes ragged, ragged and hard. So you, just by, just by, just by in, the encounter of different individuals, um, the transformation of one into the other is constantly happening. And through this, there is a sort of constant mirroring, a constant process of showing qualities of one in the other, or of experiencing my own qualities in that which is not me. Or you could even say in making experiences with a body which is not my own body, which is the body of the world and still being able to make, make my own experiences through this and maybe being able to make the most dignified experiences through that which is not my own body. And um, my writer colleague, my admired writer colleague, Nan Shepherd, of, of whom you talked about before, she's an exemplar of being able to sense through the body of hers which is the enlarged body of the earth or the body of the world and seeing let's say seeing what is general and eternal in which shows itself as individual and that's that's um, to me that's that's one of the that's that's the the, the, the absolutely precious and rare quality of her writing, of her perception. And it is, it is um, warranted by, by this, um, by, by the possibility of mutual transformation, by this possibility which, um, which lets you inhabit not only yourself, but which cons constantly lets you inhabit the whole embodied world. Because fundamentally, you are in a continuum with it. And you are, we all are, um, individuations from this whole embodied poetic experience. Yeah, so um, if we come to living bodies, that's which, which has been my specialty as a marine biologist, we come to living bodies, this becomes very clear. And I think um, it is an experience which, um, which you all know. 
Um, and it is the reason which why um, humans are uh, so much drawn into um, animated nature, into living nature. Um, it, 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 has to do, it has to do with understanding your own aliveness, my own aliveness, through the aliveness of others. And not through an analysis of what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling, so not through concepts and not through um, generalizations, but through the meeting of others, which um, then in some extent even truly nourish you. And um, so it, it goes into both directions. So it's not only about understanding myself by, for example, um, being in the presence of a tree being and seeing in this tree the principles of um, of existence, of, um, of birth and development and growth and death. It's not only one directional, it's not only um, about um, seeing myself, it's also um, about seeing what the other needs through my own experiences. So because, because we, are, we share bodies, um, we can see in bodies how they are faring existentially, um, which, which for nearly all of the time of the existence of humans has been a, a, a primordial, primordial cultural um, capacity. It's a, it's a natural capacity or an inborn capacity, but it has been cultivated in the sense that humans were um, we're sure that they had to care for the world and they had to care for the world by seeing how it fared, how, it, how it, the state was, and then changing their behavior, protecting certain species from hunting um, or um, actively enhancing the growth. All, all these things happen in, still happen in animistic societies and they have happened for, the, for hundreds of thousands of years of human existence. And this is possible because you can you can see into other beings because they are bodies and you're also a body. It's a little bit like seeing into some human's face how she feels. And um, if you enlarge your gaze, you can also see how other distant beings feel. I remember when we had these years of drought, drought in, um, in, um, on the continent, probably also in England, um, and trees in the cities were, were really thirsty and they were even dying of um, not having enough water. I remember that, that astonishingly very few humans really looked at these trees. And um, it made me sad because I know that we all, we actually all understand them if we allow ourselves to um, to let this understanding work. We understand them in the same way we understand oxygen. Um, it makes us alive. That's our understanding of it. Um, but it, it didn't happen. So I was, I was among the few um, neighbors in this condominium trying to, to water the trees. And there were others complaining that we wasted the water. And it's, it's crazy. It's, it's obviously it's part of the the state of the world that we shut down this natural way of being one body. And um, just um, somehow coming to the, into the, the, final, um, the final linear stretch of this parkour, um, one example of this understanding um, is breath. And let me just um, explain a little bit about this, um, which also shows very much how um, mutual transformation of different individuals generates insight about others in my own body. I, I already said before, um, um, we, we understand oxygen because by breathing it, it makes us be able to live. So that is a form of understanding which is totally embodied. It's not conceptual. 
we have a feeling for this. We have a feeling of this understanding because if we breathe well and calmly and good, if we breathe good air, we feel right. We feel alive. We feel um, in the right balance. You all know this. And um, the interesting thing about breath is that this matter which we breathe in comes from the bodies of other organisms. As you all know, oxygen is produced by plants, by blue-green algae, actually, most, most, more than half of it. Blue-green algae in the oceans produce more than half of the world's oxygen, but also for sure plants and trees. And, um, and this molecule comes from their bodies. It comes from their bodies, it's part of their body, it goes into our body. And um, in return, I show you this, that's my, um, that's always the slide I'm most proud of because it shows that I have um, passed some um, undergraduate exams in, in my studies. Um, so I, I, I just want to show you one thing. Um, um, be be uh, duly respectful, but don't be afraid. So what I show you is um, 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 one of the main um, metabolic cycles in our cells. Um, and what I want to show you is that if we take in food, that's another part of this being connected to, to other beings. So we take in food, we eat a plant, we eat an apple, we eat a tomato, we take in food. And food is um, carbon, and carbon goes into our body. And, um, and this cycle manages somehow the, the, the balance of our body, what goes into our body and what goes out of our body. And when we breathe out, what we breathe out is parts of our body. So it's not the burnt tomato which we breathe out, like a, a car um, exhausts burned petrol. It's, this is very different. And um, so it's parts of our body. It's parts of the matter we are consisting of, which we are um, giving away by breathing. And these become parts of the plants by being breathed in by them. And um, vice versa, we eat the material of the plants and it becomes us and we breathe the oxygen which comes from the plants and um, it becomes incorporated into ourselves. So we, we, on, a, on a material level, um, we are completely tied to, other, to others. So that it's also a form of mutual transformation what I'm showing here. It's a transformation in the sense that we are entangled uh, so profoundly um, that we cannot be separated. And we also entangle so profoundly that we intimately know about one another. We intimately know about one another and this knowledge about one another is also, that's not only a physiological fact, it's also an experiential fact. And it has to do with, the, um, with us feeling equally okay um, in the presence of other beings. Like I said, we feel okay when we breathe well and we feel less okay when we breathe, um, we have difficulty breathing. It's a very, a very contemp contemporary topic. Um, and, um, and we feel uh, great um, in the presence of other beings. Um, and I think my hypothesis is that we do this because we understand that we share breath and we share through breath the same body experiencing this shared aliveness as right if it is possible, if we can share it, if, if it's not interrupted or disrupted or um, um, chopped apart by concepts which say that this part, these flowers, um, are just things and can be disposed of. And we are um, abstract rational minds and can create the world as we wish. Then we start to feel uncomfortable, at least in the long run. 
Yeah, so, so to conclude, um, that's the last, the slide before the last slide. Um, I show you this, this picture um, from an Australian cave wall, just, just to illustrate that what, I'm, uh, what I've tried to, um, to take you with me um, in this journey is, is actually, although I, I put it um, partly in, in, into the um, wording of philosophical concepts, and partly into the wording of um, phenomenological description and partly into the wording of poetic experience. But nonetheless, it is a, a profound historical um, perception of humankind. And um, the, the, sh the world which is shared with other persons in it is something which, um, which has um, fixated humanity for, for all time being until 2000 years ago, or maybe a little bit more. So our, our way of being lost in the world is very new. It's, 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 it has been different for a very long time. And um, it was clear that this world is, is shared as a body and it is shared in relationships. And I think it's important that we, um, we, we get back to this fundamental, under, fundamental understanding. And um, just as a final suggestion, um, a little comparison between um, this older world, which I hear call animistic cosmos, um, and the uh, the Occidental paradigm, which I hear called the Western cognitive empire. That's a, that's a phrase by, I'm, I'm going to read this for you so we can go through it together. It's a phrase by uh, an, a Portuguese sociologist, um, uh, de Sousa Santos, who says the, 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 the Western cognitive empire. And I think he has, he has a point. Um, so it's a little bit wrap up of what I'm trying to explain here. Um, in the Western view, all elements of life are objects, and in the in the in the animistic or, or maybe pump psychic view, or the poetic space view, all participants of life are persons. For the Western object consists of smaller objects; it is static, static, and self-identical. On the other hand, a person consists of the process of relating; it is processual and performative. In the West, the building blocks which make an object are unrelated single entities. I hope you, you can recognize some of the, the features our world is built at the moment. And in the, um, in the in a world of um, poetic meaning, the process of relating which creates persons at the same time establishes community. So there's relation all over. In in dualism, Western dualism, objects do not communicate. Any perceived communication is a projection of the human observer. So if you have the experience, this tree with the red leaves, which I showed to you, tells you something, then you, it's very probable that you find somebody who tells you, oh, you're just projecting. You're projecting your personal feelings on a, on a, on a dead body, on, on, on a biological machine. In another world, in a different animated world, the idea is that persons communicate about their needs and desires. And this communication is the relational process which creates more persons and provides fecundity for the place. So in this world, it is absolutely necessary to communicate with other beings, with other persons, with other non-human persons. But in our world, objects have no inner life. And in a, a world, in the poetic space view, all persons, and I'm not only talking about human persons, I'm talking about all embodied individuals have feelings, desires, and needs. In our traditions, objects must be addressed by physical manipulation. In this other world, persons need to be addressed in a way that takes into account their desire to satisfy their needs. So they need to be addressed in a way that allows them 
to be alive. In the, the, the Western picture, the world is silent. Connection and communication are impossible or they, are only, they can only be invented or imagined. So we are cut off from life. In this other world, if a person communicates well, she's provided her place in the collective of life forever. And the consequence of um, the, the cognitive empire is that culture must be built in order to give ourselves life in a dead world. So it must be built against the world. It protects us against the meaninglessness of the cosmos. It protects us against everything which wants us to pull down into the, the dead cosmos. That's the role of culture in the Western cognitive empire. In an animistic worldview, we must build culture as continuation of a life-giving cosmos because culture connects us with the meaningfulness of the cosmos. So culture is not different from cosmos. It's our conscious way of creating reciprocity and mutual transformation. Okay. So that was that. It was a bit longer than promised. And um, these are some of the publications where um, some of these thoughts are crystallized and some are not written yet where some of these thoughts hopefully will bud further into um, twigs and branches and rhizomes. Thanks so much for your attention and now I'm up for a discussion.